Good morning, Grace Church. Trust that you've had a, a good week. We sure are missing you, and we are looking very much forward to our reunion together. Last night, Kathy and I enjoyed a Zoom session with our home group, and I hope you and your home group or you and your Bible study are able to get together through Zoom and enjoy getting caught up with each other and staying in touch and encouraging one another. Again, thank you to all who are on the care team and I encourage you to continue to call on a regular basis those that you're caring for. And even if you're not on the care team, let me encourage you to perhaps make it a goal to call one family a day just to check in with each other and to love on each other and to encourage each other. Thank you all to uh, those who continue to give and uh, provide financially for uh, Grace Church as well as for the love offering. We're very grateful to you. Well, this morning we want to continue our series, Yeshua Messiah King. And let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, beginning with verse 13. Uh, the parallel passages are in Mark and Luke. You can find those on the notes if you would like to download those. I think I've shared with the church family, but very briefly, Kathy and I had a difficult two and a half years of dating. And toward the very end, when we were at the point of a decision, I was very much committed and ready to uh, Mary Kathy, but she was indecisive. She still had her doubts about being married. She still had uh, thoughts about maybe being a missionary. And long story short, uh, after several days, uh, to my great joy, Kathy made the decision that she would marry me. And then from that point on, with that critical decision made, uh, obviously we moved forward towards marriage and uh, we were wed five months later. As we study our passage today, Jesus seeks a decision from his disciples. And what we will discover is based on their decision, Jesus then was able to move forward in his kingdom plans. Now let's read the text together, Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they, they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven." Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. In verses 13 and 14, we see the first question that Jesus asked his disciples. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But Jesus wanted to know from his men what they were hearing. In general, people were 
putting Jesus on par with some of the great prophets, but they were not recognizing, they were not believing him to be the Messiah. Well, then Jesus put this same question to his disciples as we see in verses 15 and 16. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. As we will see, Simon Peter served as the spokesman for the disciples. And he very emphatically, very much with conviction in the the language of the text, affirmed his conviction that Jesus is the Messiah. The term Christ is the Greek for the Hebrew Mashiach, both meaning the anointed one, clearly messianic title. And then the son of the living God is a messianic title as well. Uh, One of the major places where we see that is in Psalm Two, which is a messianic psalm. And so Peter very emphatically declares his belief, and I believe as the spokesman for the disciples, that he is also declaring the belief of the disciples, except perhaps for Judas. Now in light of their decision, in light of their conviction that Jesus is the Messiah, I believe Jesus now can move ahead in his kingdom program, as we will see. I believe in the next section what we see is Jesus declaring war. Obviously, he was pleased with Peter's response. And we see in verse 17, he says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And so Jesus pronounces that Peter is blessed, and he's blessed because he has received this insight, this illumination as to who Jesus really is. He has received that from his heavenly Father. Now, in verse 18... Jesus, still talking to Peter, does a play on the word rock. So he says to his disciple, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, the name Peter is from the Greek word petros. Now, Petros is a masculine noun, and it refers to a stone or a rock that you could hold in your hand. On the other hand, the term rock, as in the phrase, and on this rock I will build my church, is a different word. It's the word Petra. Now, Petra is a feminine noun, and it refers to a large rock. It's the word that would be used to describe half dome in Yosemite. And so, contrary to the teaching that some of us have received from the Catholic Church, the rock upon which Jesus would build his church cannot be Peter because the grammar doesn't allow it. We know from, for instance, our study of the Spanish language that you have words that are in a masculine form and so they must then match up with other masculine words, feminine with feminine, neuter with neuter. And so here, Petros is masculine, Petra is feminine. They cannot be referring to the same entity. And so the rock cannot be Peter. Now some people, and I think a case can be made for this, believe that Petra, the rock upon which Jesus will build his church, is what 
Peter has confessed about Jesus, Peter's declaration that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it's that truth that the church is built upon. And so there, a case can be made that the rock on which Jesus will build his church could be Peter's declaration that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. But I want to suggest a third possibility, and this is my own personal conviction, and that is the rock to which Jesus was referring cannot be Peter, probably is not Peter's confession about Jesus, but is actually the rock on which they are standing at the time that they have this dialogue. Let me explain. In Matthew 16, 13, Matthew records that Jesus and his disciples are in the region of Caesarea Philippi. Now, as you can see in the map, Caesarea Philippi is quite a bit north of the Sea of Galilee. And it's in Gentile territory. And it, the city is built at the base of Mount Hermon. Now, Mount Hermon is the highest peak in Israel. And the snowpack, the melt of the snowpack, like the Sierras are for us, the snowpack on Mount Hermon is one of the major sources for the water of the Jordan River. But it's the spiritual background of Caesarea Philippi that is actually key to our study today. According to the Old Testament, this region was called Bashan. And Bashan was ruled by two pagan kings named Sihon and Og. And the Old Testament records that Sihon and Og were descendants of the Rephaim, giants. And their two capital cities, Ashtaroth and Edre, were the domains uh, were inhabited by the Rephaim. Now the Rephaim were descendants of the Nephilim. The Nephilim were the offspring from the union of demons and human women prior to the great flood. And that's recorded in Genesis chapter 6. They're called the sons of God because they were created directly by God, but they had fallen, they had followed Satan in his rebellion against God, and they were sent to defile the human race so that the Genesis 3.15 prophecy that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent that prophecy would be defeated because the line of the woman, the seed of the woman, would, in this attack, become defiled and would not produce one who then could defeat and destroy Satan. That was Satan's attempt. And it failed because God found Noah and his family righteous in his sight. The point is that Sihon, Sihon and Og were descendants of the Nephilim. And as such, they were pagan. And uh, this was a, a rich um, stronghold of, of demons. Now, the cities of Ashtaroth and Edre, the capital, of, of the capital cities of Bashan, and the Rephaim were recorded not only in the scriptures, but also they are recorded, they are found in what are called Canaanite cuneiform tablets that were written by the Ugarit people. And the Ugarit people 
believed that the Rephaim, like Sihon and Og, were the spirits of dead warrior kings. And they believed that the two cities of Ashtaroth and Edre were the entryway to the underworld. In other words, they believed that Bashan and its capital cities were the gates of Sheol in the Hebrew language, in the Greek language, it would be Hades. In other words, the Ugarit people believed that the area of Bashan, the region of Bashan, was the actual entryway to the underworld. Contributing to the darkness and the demonic character of this area of Bashan is the fact that when the kingdom of Israel divided after uh, King Saul, his, his son Rehoboam caused the kingdom to split into the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. The king that succeeded Rehoboam is named Jeroboam. And his concern was that the ten northern tribes of the kingdom of Israel would eventually drift back under the monarch, under the king of Judah, by going back to Jerusalem three times a year to celebrate the feasts of the Lord. And they would then be back in Jerusalem under the influence and in relationship with the southern kingdom. And out of that, Jeroboam was concerned that there would be a, re a movement to reunite the two kingdoms. So what he did is in the northern kingdom of Israel, in the southern portion of the border with Judah, he built a, a sanctuary and a golden calf. And then in the northernmost region, in the tribe of Dan, which is right here in the region of Bashan, just south of Bashan, he built another golden calf and a temple. And that's where he directed the ten tribes of Israel to go in order to worship. And so Jeroboam committed great evil against Yahweh, the true God of Israel, by encouraging the ten tribes of Israel to worship the golden calf, to a false god, and that then just contributed to the ten northern tribes going deeper into idolatry and worshiping the Baals of the Canaanite peoples that were left in the land that were not conquered at the time of the conquest under Joshua. Then contributing again to the darkness and the demonic nature of this area, Jewish tradition taught that it was on Mount Hermon where the demons, the sons of God, the demons landed, so to speak, when they came to the earth to cohabitate with human women prior to the flood in order to defile the human race and prevent the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. And that was right there at Mount Horeb and Caesarea Philippi, where they were with Jesus, sits right at the foot of the mountain. And so this is a very dark place spiritually, historically. Also contributing to this is that at the base of Mount Hermon, there is a massive cliff of red stone streaked with black that dominates the landscape and Caesarea Philippi is, is built up to that huge cliff area and around it. And that area became the center of worship for the Greek god Pan, who was half goat, the lower half of his body was that of a goat. The upper half was that of a man. And he played the, the pipes, the pan pipes. And the worship of pan was 
it was just wicked. It involved uh, blood sacrifices. It involved debauchery, drunkenness, sexual orgies uh, designed to appease uh, not only Pan, but uh, the demons at the time of fertility, uh, the time of, of, you know, the planting of crops and then the harvesting of crops. And it was just a very wicked, uh, cultic uh, worship. And then in later years, in addition to Pan, Caesarea Philippi and, and, and that cliff area uh, also became the center of uh, worship for Zeus. They built uh, a temple for Pan and then later a temple for Zeus. And so this is just a very, very dark area spiritually. It's a, de- it's a demonic stronghold in the region of Bashan, and then more specifically here in Caesarea Philippi. Now, there's one other fact, and I'm trying to show it in that third picture. Hopefully you can see that cave that's at the base of the cliff. And that cave at the time of Jesus, out of that cave came a large amount of water that created the river that's now called Banyas. It too supplies the Jordan River. But there was a large river that came out of that cave at the time of Jesus. Now, an earthquake about 100 years ago changed where the spring uh, exit. It now exits uh, uh, several feet away from the cave. It exits underneath the cliff but it still supplies a significant amount of water to that area. And again, eventually to the Jordan River to the south. But the significance of that cave is that in the days of Jesus, that cave was considered by the locals to be a gateway to the underworld. In other words, it was one of the gates of Hades, believed by the pagan populace of that area. And in fact, when they were worshiping Pan and seeking to appease the God that he might send the spirits to bless the land and make the land fertile for that year's crops, when they would sacrifice their animal sacrifices, they would throw those animal sacrifices into that cave. And again, they believe that's where spirits from the underworld uh, made entrance into the world and then returned back to the underworld. And so again, this place where Jesus was, where he brought his disciples, and I believe it's, it's there at, at the cliff, and then the whole area is, is rock and it's strewn with rocks, as you can imagine, where a river uh, pounds, you know, rock, it, it it knocks all kinds of rocks off and so on. So this is, this is not only this massive cliff, a Petra, but then all around them are Petras, rocks that you can hold in your hands uh, of all different sizes. And so we can see Jesus' play on words. He's playing on the word rock. And he says to Peter, Peter, you're a Petras. You're a, a rock that you can hold in your hand. And I think the point there is it's, it's, it's a compliment. He's saying, Peter, you're, you're made out of, of, of strong stuff. But then he says, and on this rock, and I think it's the one they're standing on, and on this rock, representing the fact that they are standing right there at the gate of Hades. They are standing right in the middle of Satan's territory. They are standing right here in this demonic stronghold. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, it's right here in the midst of Satan's territory that I'm going to build my church. In other words, it's a declaration of war. Jesus is saying now, in light of the fact that his disciples believe, the disciples are convinced that Jesus is the promised Messiah, based on that decision, 
Jesus now moves ahead with his kingdom program. We know that the kingdom is delayed. The messianic kingdom is delayed because of the day of rejection. He's begun to reveal characteristics of the kingdom in this era, what we call the church age. And now that the disciples are firm in their belief that he is the Messiah, Jesus now can begin to move to establish his church. Because the disciples are going to be the foundation of the church, they are going to be the eyewitness testimony that establishes the church as they bear witness to their personal experience of Jesus' life, of his teachings, of his crucifixion, that is the blood sacrifice that forgives sin, pays the penalty for sin, of his death and his resurrection. And now that the disciples are convinced that he is the Messiah, Jesus now begins to talk about the church and the fact that he is going to, to build the church because now his men, the men by which he's going to do that, they're on board. They believe that he's the Messiah. There's an interesting thing here that convinces me that the rock is where they're standing. And that is when we read the phrase, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In the Greek text, the word against is not there. It's supplied. And so it changes the connotation of what Jesus is saying. Traditionally, what we hear is that he's going to build his church and that the church is going to survive Satan's attacks against it. In other words, Satan will not be successful to destroy or vanquish the church. The church will survive Satan's and his evil hosts, their attacks against the church. But that term against isn't there. And the connotation is that Jesus says right here, in the middle of Satan's territory, we're going on the attack. We're taking the battle to Satan. I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not be able to resist it, will not be able to stop it, will not be able to stand against it, is what Jesus is saying. He sees the church as the aggressor. He sees the church as taking the battle to Satan, not the other way around. And now that his men are on board, because they're key, it's the disciples that are going to bear witness as the apostles, the eyewitness uh, testimony to the risen Christ, they are the ones through whom Jesus is going to establish the church and he's going to establish it right in Satan's territory and he's going to take the fight to Satan and Satan is the one who will not be able to stop it. And the church will be victorious. Jesus is saying, I'm going to build my church right here on the gates of hell, and I'm going to bury them. I'm going to bury them. And praise the Lord Jesus that the church will prevail. That Satan, in all of his attempts, and in our day, in the 19th and 20th centuries, have we not seen satanically motivated attempts to destroy the church in one that we glory in is in China. The closing of China to Western missionaries that took place in the 1800s. And then when China was opened again to the world to find that they were, there were over 50 million Christians. Satan tried to stop the church and he cannot stop the church because the church is the truth. The church is empowered by 
the Spirit of God. The church is led by the truth of God's Word. And Satan cannot stop it. And there's coming a day, bless God, when God will finally destroy Satan and all of his evil ones in the lake of fire. And the church will prevail. Now, for sake of time, we've got to stop our study there. Because obviously Jesus goes on to explain to Peter and the disciples a few of the unique ways that Jesus is going to use them to build the church. And we'll pick that up in our next session of Yeshua Messiah King. I hope you're encouraged to be part of the church, part of the church victorious, that Satan has not cannot, will not be able to stop. Let's pray together. Father, we praise you for this passage of Scripture. We praise you for sending Jesus into the world, directly into Satan's territory as the prince of the power of the air, as the God of this world. And yet you sent the Lord Jesus in fulfillment of your promises and prophecies. And he has built his church. And Satan has not been able to stop it and will not be able to stop it. And we long for that day when the church is victorious. And when Satan and his evil ones, when sin and death, when wickedness, and pain and sorrow and suffering are vanquished. Father, we thank you for your grace in our lives that you, like Peter, have opened our eyes to understand that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that he is our Savior, that he is the one who will bring us peace, the forgiveness of our sin, a restored relationship with you. Father, thank you for opening our eyes as you did Peter's so that we could put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Give us courage, give us boldness, give us wisdom, give us opportunities to bear witness to the Lord Jesus Christ and to win back those who are still in Satan's territory, that they might be set free and that they might be given life and life eternal with you. Father, help us to be steadfast as we continue through this coronavirus quarantine. Open our eyes to see ways that we can be ministering and blessing others, both in our church family, but in our community as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with us this morning. The Lord bless you. I trust that you will have an enjoyable day together with your family and with your loved ones. Lord bless you as you continue to serve him. <laughs>